Visual intelligence means not only looking up from your screens and engaging the world around you, but filtering out a lot of that noise and a lot of that information to see what matters. Hello and welcome to The Daily Helping with Dr. Richard Schuster. Food for the brain, knowledge from the experts, tools to win at life. I'm your host, Dr. Richard. Whoever you are, wherever you're from, and whatever you do, this is the show that is going to help you become the best version of yourself. Each episode, you will hear from some of the most amazing, talented, and successful people on the planet who followed their passions and strive to help others. Join our movement to get a million people each day to commit acts of kindness for others. Together, we're going to make the world a better place. Are you ready? Because it's time for your daily helping. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Daily Helping Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Richard, and we have an extraordinary guest to share with you today. Amy Herman is a lawyer and art historian who uses works of art to symmetrically sharpen observation, analysis, and communication skills. By showing people how to look closely at painting, sculpture, and photography, she helps them hone their visual intelligence to recognize the most pertinent and useful information, as well as recognize biases that impede decision-making. She developed her Art of Perception seminar in 2000 to improve medical students' observation and communication skills with their patients when she was the head of education at the Frick Collection in New York City. She subsequently adapted the program for a wide range of professionals and lead sessions internationally for the New York City Police Department, the FBI, the French National Police, the Department of Defense, Interpol, the State Department, Fortune 500 companies, first responders, and the military, as well as the intelligence community. In her highly participatory presentation, she demonstrates the relevance of visual literacy across the professional spectrum and how the analysis of works of art affords participants in her program an innovative way to refresh their sense of critical inquiry and reconsider the skills necessary for improved performance and effective leadership. This program has been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the CBS Evening News, and Smithsonian Magazine, among others. Her TED Talk, Seeing What Matters, was delivered in Toronto in October 2018 and is currently live at TED.com. Amy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. What a pleasure it is to be here. There happy, was, Friday. <laughs> oh, happy Friday to you too. And there were so many exciting things that I just read about and, and I can't wait to get into them with you. So what I am so fascinated about is you're a lawyer, but you've shifted and you've got this whole other world you've created that's uniquely you and helping people in so many different ways. But what I want to do is take a step back because as you know, when I do these episodes, I really like to find out what are driving people? What is their why? So how did you go from becoming a lawyer, which is so radically different in yes. terms of scope of work from what you're doing today? How did you get into this and, and create the art of perception? Well, I can tell you that the aha moment that I had, because I really did have one, predates my being a lawyer. Uh, I was a junior in college and I was taking an art history class. I had studied art history in undergraduate. And I'll never forget that my art history professor put two paintings side by side up on the screen, because that's how we used to teach paintings next to each other. And they took my breath away. These two paintings by Mark Rothko just took my breath away. And I thought, somebody painted those. And I've never forgotten them. And I went to law school and I became a practicing lawyer. And I never forgot how much looking at works of art moved me. And I knew somehow in my gut that I needed to get back to the world of art. I didn't know how or in what guise. But after practicing law for five years and working in museums on the weekend, I said, I need to give this a try. Life is too short. I can't grow old practicing law and being in courtrooms when I didn't enjoy it so much. So I left the practice of law and I went to work in a museum as a lawyer. And one thing led to another and I went to another museum and I worked my way through administrative positions until I became the head of education at the Frick Collection in New York City. And it was there that I was able to start this program that I do for medical students. And it combined, it actually combined the two disciplines that I knew, visual analysis and legal analysis, looking at paintings and looking at the world around us from multiple perspectives. And I combined them to create the art of perception. That is so wild. So talk to us about, for those who are 
not familiar with visual analysis. Talk to us about what you mean by that. Visual analysis, and I use the word, the phrase visual intelligence, that's the title of my book, is the idea that we are barraged with information. We have so much information available to us now, especially because of technology. It's a 24-hour nonstop stream of information. And visual intelligence means not only looking up from your screens and engaging the world around you, but filtering out a lot of that noise and a lot of that information to see what matters. That's sort of my catchphrase. How do we see what matters? Because we see so much and the brain can't take all of that in. And how do we distill out the information that we need to live our lives with purpose and to do our jobs as effectively as we can? So here's my big follow-up question. How do we do that? Well, <laughs> um, it's a, I have a whole book about this, <laughs> but I happen to use art as the vehicle to do it. Uh, I have chosen looking at works of art, painting, sculpture, and photography as a new set of data because all of the people that I work with, none of, I should say none of the people that I work with look at art for a living. So I give their left brain a rest. I engage their right brain, teach them how to look at works of art, think about communicating what they see so that when they go back to their world, they have a different template and a different lens through which to see their work. And so visual intelligence comes, it does take training and it does take practice. Nobody ever masters it. But I find that looking at works of art is not threatening. And best of all, everybody sees something. Nobody can look at a work of art and say, well, I don't know what I'm looking at. You see color, you see form, you see line. And it's really not important to me if people like what they're looking at or not, but how do they describe it? What's interesting is that this is something that you originally created for medical students and yet you've adapted it to so many different things, Mm -hmm. so many different fields and professions. Mm -hmm. So within art itself, so is it, I I know you said the form, the line, those things aren't, aren't terribly important. What are the things in the paintings that are important? Is is it themes? Is it, you know, what is there that, so so for example, let's talk about business. Let's Mm -hmm. let's pretend that you're giving this seminar to, you know, people who are focused on leadership and and business. How do they do that? Like, what are they looking at in the painting? And then how do they apply that to be more proficient in what they're doing within their roles? Well, there are two approaches for business and leadership. First, when I show them a painting, I say, tell me what you see in the big picture, because leaders are charged with the broad lens. You know, what's going on in the big picture? And then I say to them, what are some of the details that you noticed? Because I want them to reconcile being big picture and small detail people, because some people pride themselves on saying, well, I'm a detail person. And I say, you know, that's wonderful, but you also need to be a big picture person. So I ask leaders to identify the big picture, no pun intended, what's happening in the work of art, and also some of the small details that they notice. And then I very gently and kindly point out to them what they didn't see. Some of the the details and the big picture aspects that they missed completely. And it's through no fault of their own. It's just that we get so focused like this that we miss certain things. So I point out not only what they saw, but what they didn't see. And sometimes the discussion goes so far into what we didn't see that they take it back to their world and they think, well, what else have I been missing? If I miss that, What else? I call it the mahogany table because it's like looking at a fancy portrait of this woman and missing the incredible mahogany table at the bottom of the painting. And then the second approach with leaders and and people in business is to show them a work of art that has a lot going on. And I say, where are you? What would you do if you were standing in this painting? What are the resources that are available to you? Who would you talk to? How would you organize the chaos? What would you do? Because it's thrusting them into a new, unfamiliar situation. And I believe that leaders rise to the occasion and they're very adaptable and they have to demonstrate agility. So it's not just talent. Everybody that comes to my sessions is talented. But when I show them works of art, I say to them, show me your agility. Show me how quickly you can jump into this painting. Where are you? What do you see? What don't you see? And how do you explain it to me with clarity, precision, and objectivity? Now, obviously, this we're, we're doing this. Uh, oh, well, we're doing this over video, but people are likely listening to this in their cars or on their way to the to work or the gym. So, take us through. So, let, let's say somebody is looking at a painting, and I presume it can be any painting. Well, I handpick. I have thousands of works of art in my archive. Okay, probably any painting would work, but I try to pick ones that are conducive to conversation. Abstract works are hard. <laughs> we work ourselves up to abstract work. But uh, I usually take representational or narrative works of art, and I use those. And I should preface this by telling you that I have a couple of rules for all my 
programs. The first one is the two words that we're not allowed to use are obviously and clearly. Why do I ask people not to use the words obviously and clearly? Because we live and work in a complex world and what's obvious to you may not be obvious to me. So instead of saying, well, obviously she's in a hurry, I prefer that people say, well, it appears to me that she's in a hurry because of A, B, and C. I don't want anyone to make assumptions that will be, that will degrade people or make them feel ignorant in any way. So I just ask people to explain why something is obvious. So no, obviously, no, clearly. I never let them take notes during my session because I want them to rely on their inherent sense of observation. When we have to talk to people, we don't say, oh, let me consult my notes. You have to tell me what you see. And finally, I always say there's no delegation of a spokesperson. Everyone in my program has to speak. How large are, are these programs typically? So what's, what's that audience size look like? You know, it really varies. Uh, I've done the program when I work with sections of the military, United States Special Operations Groups. It's a team of eight. And I have them in a museum for six hours. And I've also done the program for 5,000 people in a room. And I make it participatory and they work with each other. So ideally, it's 25 to 50, but it can be in the thousands or fewer than 10. But I, I make sure that it's participatory and everybody talks and sees something. And so if one is looking at this through the lens of relationships, talk to us about how you could apply the art of perception into our lives with our significant others or children if we have them or, or our parents. How, how does that work? Well, to be perfectly candid, when I started this program, the idea of relationships was not on my radar at all. But I wish I had a dime for every time somebody came up to me and said, you know, I can't wait to use this on the job, but I realize how important communication is in my personal relationships and that what I've been communicating and how I've been listening really needs some work. I've been talking to my wife for 10 years, but I realized that my listening skills could really use some help. And one of the things I tell people about relationships is we have two ears and one mouth for a reason. We need to use them proportionally. And we don't, we should be listening twice as much as we're talking in all relationships, work and otherwise, even as leaders. And in personal relationships, we need to be uh, attuned not only to what people are saying to us, but what they're not saying to us. What are they omitting? And I believe that information is as important as what is being said to us. And the other thing I talk about communication, both professionally and personally, is that communication is a two-way street. It's not just how you say it. You have to be mindful of how is it being heard? Who's listening to you? And how is your message being heard? Because if it's not being heard, your message doesn't matter. So I'm hearing a lot of talking. Talking and listening is what I've heard. In terms of applying visual analysis to personal relationships, what what would you say are the tenets there to to begin with for somebody? This comes from a parent-teacher conference when my son was in fourth grade. And I remember the fourth grade teacher telling us when we went in for the conference that she said, when these kids come in in the morning, before they open their mouths, I take a look at them and I already know who's having a bad day. And you know what? The same is true for adults. So we need to be cognizant of the four things that I use all the time, body language, facial expression, nonverbal communication, and eye contact. People speak volumes about themselves before they open their mouths. And adults need to be attuned to that, not only in their partners and their personal relationships, because you can see if somebody's not engaged in the conversation, you can see if someone doesn't want to be there. But on a business front, you can look at someone and know if they've had a bad night. And know that you're not going to get a 30-page report from them by the end of the day. Don't even try. So to be aware of body language, facial expression, nonverbal communication, and eye contact involves looking. And I believe those are such rich sources of information that we can use them to our benefit. And it's not exploitive in any way. You're not going into someone's personal space by just observing their body language. And I think in both personal and professional relationships, those indicia are really, really valuable. Outstanding. And, and so I, I'm envisioning like all of these parents and kids getting on their computers and looking at art together. And finding- That's what, that would be a dream <laughs> for me. That would be an absolute dream. Ask my poor son. He has to look at every slide that I use. The kid's grown up with it. And I show his, my slides to him because he doesn't have a filter. He's 16 and he'll say, well, what do you want people to say about this work of art? Or when he says, hey, that's really cool. I know that I should use it. 
We'll be right back to our interview after this. Hey, Daily Helping listeners, Dr. Richard here, and I am so excited to share with you something that we've been working on for the past 18 months, introducing Personal Helping, which we created because everybody struggles with something. Want to lose weight, improve your relationships, or overcome long-standing obstacles? Then you need Personal Helping to smash your goals. Personal Helping utilizes a system developed by myself and my team of behavioral science experts, which incorporates the principles of neuroscience as well as technology. While personal helping is not therapy or medical advice, our personal helpers provide a unique perspective and accountability which can reinvigorate your life. Personal helping sessions are conducted in real time via video conference on your smartphone, tablet, or computer. Go to the dailyhelping.com and then the personal helping section where you can download the Daily Helping app and sign up for your first session today. And now, back to the show. So talk to us then, you know, and, and I'm going to use your personal story. You mentioned you've got a 16-year-old. And so how has visual na- analysis specifically helped you improve your relationship with your kiddo? Well, in many ways. Uh, I, I start out by saying that I dedicated my book to him because he has grown up with this program. Uh, he, you know, he was three when I started it. So we've been doing it a long time. But again, kids are not born with a filter. And they're very honest with you. If I want to know if I'm wearing an outfit that looks good, they'll tell me. They'll say, no, mom, change your clothes, or that looks good. But also, I talked to him about reading people's body language. And when he came home from school, I guess we started this when he was about nine or 10. Instead of saying, you know, how was your day, as every parent does, and you get a mono, you know, a monosyllable, fine, good, bad, I would say to him, what's something that caught your eye today? Interesting. Or I'd say, you know, what did you see that was really weird today? Or at night, before he'd go to bed, I'd say, tell me about something that happened that you wouldn't tell me about in the ordinary course of your day. And I find that by opening those doors and asking him to tell me about something that he saw opened up whole lines of communication and led to so many other discussions. And it was so funny. He told me a story. He's in high school now. And he started a new high school this year. And he noticed something in the classroom. And the teacher said, Ian, how did you even notice that? And he turned around and said to the teacher, do you know who my mom is? (laughs) So yeah, we use it all the time. And um, sometimes he says, can we just turn the art of perception off today, mom? I just, I need a day to relax. But we use it in all aspects of our lives. And, And I can imagine that like any other skill, if one practices visual analysis, now, it helps you be more aware of your environment. And when you're more aware of your environment, you think about stressors differently. You handle difficult situations differently. Am I on point with that? You're very much on point. I think that one of the exercises that I give my classes, if I see them you know, multiple times, I say the assignment they have is to go out into the world and when they come back to tell me one thing that they noticed that they wouldn't have noticed before. and The exercise is to look at something that catches your attention or captures your your sight and form a a short narrative in your head. How would you describe that to someone else? And I find myself talking to myself all the time saying how I would narrate that to someone. When my son takes the subway in New York, I was trying to give him personal safety tips. And I say, every time the subway doors open, I want you to notice who gets on, who gets off, who's around you. And how is that changing every time the doors open? And yes, it sounds exhausting, but it's kind of a fun visual exercise, especially in New York City. And if you find yourself creating narratives in your head, I think it improves your ability to communicate and your ability to talk about your own situational awareness, both for personal safety and just to engage in the world around you. Love that. That's beautiful. And in terms of one of the things we talk about in psychology, and this is where I think there's a very interesting connection, is something called cognitive reframing. Mm-hmm. where we actually look at something that is a stressor upsetting to us, but we reshift the way that we view it. Mm-hmm. And through that lens, we look at it in a more positive or healthier fashion. Mm-hmm. It sounds a lot like what you talk about with visual analysis. Absolutely. Absolutely. I 
some of the clients and participants in my sessions, they do tough jobs. They're, you know, leading task forces to combat child pornography or human trafficking, or I work with police departments dealing with domestic violence, and they have to deal with some pretty tough subjects. And so by giving them additional tools to engage in their world visually and to help think about it, as you said, in a reframing or a repurposing to be able to help these people and to communicate more effectively what it is that they notice, not only can it help them you know, find the perpetrators, but it can also help in their advocacy on behalf of the victims because they broaden their lens to not just focus on the perpetrators of the crimes, but also to think about the effects of the victims and maybe broaden the lens to include advocacy for them as well. Is there any particular story that comes to mind in, in which a law agency or, or some entity that you trained use your specific, the art of perception to do something phenomenal, catch a criminal or, or make some changes? Is there anything that stands out in your mind? Yeah, that- there's one story. It's quite sad, but it just underscores that noticing details can be so important. Two detectives were called to a crime scene in a very industrial part of New York. And they were told on the radio that a woman had been found dead, rolled up in a carpet. And the initial responders had made a judgment call that uh, the woman found at the crime scene was a prostitute. They just made a visual call and said, you know, she was in this industrial area And when my detectives got there, one of them had taken my course and he looked at the body and he said to himself, he said he remembered visual analysis is looking at the big picture and the small details. And he said, rather than just dismissing this as, you know, a prostitute who had been killed, he looked at the body and he saw freshly pedicured toes and newly manicured nails. And given the day of the week and he put his experience together and he said, this isn't a prostitute. You've come to the wrong conclusion. And it turned out to be a young graduate student who had been missing and kidnapped from the city. Wow. And I tell you that because not that the murder of a prostitute doesn't matter. Of course it does. But by noticing the fresh pedicure and the manicure of the nails switched his inquiry. And he said, there's something else going on here. And it turns out they were able to identify this as a missing graduate student. And so I tell you that because Small details, who looks at painted toenails, who looks at painted fingernails and thinks about consequences and how we notice things. I'll give you one other example. I often talk about what's called the pertinent negative. How do we notice what's not there? And uh, an investigator was called to a boating fatality crime scene. And the witness to the boating fatality said the boat flipped over and the occupant drowned underneath. And the witness had seen the whole thing and was very upset. So they investigated further and It turns out when they flipped the boat over, the investigator noticed something strange. All the boat's registration papers at the end of the boat were not wet. So it was something negative. Everything in the boat had been wet except these registration papers. And he he raised the question. He said, if the boat really flipped over, as the witness said that it did, why were these papers at the end of the boat not wet? And based on that critical observation of what he didn't see, he didn't see wet papers, the investigation shifted from accidental boating fatality to homicide investigation. Wow. Yep. That's so powerful. And so the pertinent negative is a, a concept I want to dive a little bit deeper into. Sure. So let's talk about, so you're explaining it as taking a look at what's not there. Mm-hmm. So I get how that absolutely makes sense in the boating investigation you just described. Mm-hmm. Talk to us about how we would apply that in our own lives and in the real world. I think the pertinent negative, I should start by defining it. And telling you that, <clears throat> that I borrow the concept from emergency medicine. The concept comes from emergency medicine, and it's defined very simply as stating what isn't there. So if a patient comes into an emergency room and a physician thinks the person is suffering from appendicitis, appendicitis has three symptoms. If symptom one is present and symptom two is present, but symptom three is conspicuously absent, it's the pertinent negative. You need to say it's not there because then it's not appendicitis. So it's looking at what you expect to happen. And then if one thing is missing, you need to say that it's missing because then it changes what you think is there. Sounds counterintuitive to talk about what's not there, but it can really be life-saving. So I think the pertinent negative when we're looking at it in terms of people, it's behaviors that don't manifest. So if you expect to give news to your family and you think they're going to be overjoyed and then they're not, 
You notice that they're not overjoyed and you need to figure out why. I tell teachers and I tell parents what your children say to you or what your children don't say to you is as important as what they do say, what they choose to share with you. And looking at what isn't said is often indicative of a problem. And so we have to be able to think at something, think and look at something from 360 degrees like we do sculpture. We walk around sculpture, we walk around people and their observations and what they say to really process what did they say, but what didn't they say? How often does someone talk about their new boyfriend or girlfriend as compared to a last relationship? You know, I noticed my friend was here for dinner. He didn't mention his partner once. What does that say to me? Maybe he had other things to talk about, but he wasn't gushing with love. So there was a conspicuous absence of talking about his partner. Well, that makes perfect sense. And I I know that when there are theories and concepts and systems that are designed, they often change over time. And they're often changed because of paradigm shifts, either societally or because of experiences. As you've been moving, you've been working with this for a very long time. You developed this in 2000. Has there anything that's happened along the way that has impacted you to where you have created some shifts in terms of how you apply the art of perception? Absolutely. Uh, I'm fortunate that you know many of my encounters with my clients are real game changers. You know, I walk away from presentations and I think, wow, that's going to change the way I see everything. But I think the biggest paradigm shift that I've had happened in August of 2014. Uh, I went for a routine doctor's appointment and the doctor came back after looking at my uh, films and said, you know, I have bad news. Uh, I'm sorry to tell you, but you have cancer. Here's the tumor. It's fast growing. It's aggressive. And we need to take some action. And then that went on to explanations of chemotherapy and surgery. And I had long hair my whole adult life. And the doctor told me that because of the treatment that I needed, I was going to lose all my hair. Now, you don't know me well, but you know me well enough. Uh, I'm pretty candid. And I said to the doctor, I'm really sorry, but I don't have time for any of that. I'm raising my son. I'm writing a book. I run this company and I don't have time for chemotherapy. I really don't want to lose my hair. And surgery is just, you know, it's a no brainer. I don't have time for that. And I'll never forget what she said. She looked me in the eye and she said, you need to make the time, Amy. She said, because if you don't make the time to take care of this, you're not going to be here to do any of those things that you need to do. And that really struck me. That really changed the game. And when I left and I processed processed what she said, I thought, okay, I think I have another lease on life here. I think I'm treatable, but it's going to suck. As they say, it's going to be awful. And it was. But with my village and my support and my attitude that said, you know what, you just need to get past this because they say the only way out is through. That was really true. The only way out was through. And after 16 sessions of chemotherapy and five times on the operating table, shaving my head, I learned two things. I learned that hair comes back. Here it is. My hair is back and it turns out to be the least of your issues. But the more important thing that really shifted my whole way of seeing the world And I bring this to both my personal and my professional life is I don't sweat the small stuff. I just, I can't do it anymore because I realize that the resources we have, we need to save them for the things that really need our attention. You know, you and I had to reschedule because we had this, you know, an unforeseen event happen. I had to evacuate my building and I couldn't get to you. And while I was very upset because I want to be respectful of people's time and I don't want them to think that I take their time for granted, there was nothing I could do about it. It was out of my control and you were flexible. I was apologetic and we moved on and we rescheduled. I didn't worry the whole day. Oh my gosh, I wasted Dr. Richard's time. I feel terrible. Yes, I was, I was upset, but it was beyond my control and you can only apologize so much. And here we are. Things can be fixed. I've decided, you know, most things can be fixed. And I always ask my son when he's upset or we're facing a problem. And I, the first question I say is, is anyone dying here? I say, because if no one's dying, we can take care of this. And that's, what I, that's the approach. You know, it's aspirational. I try. It's not that I don't lose my temper sometimes and I don't get annoyed when my flight is delayed. But I bring it back and I say, all right, what can be fixed and what's out of my control? And let's roll with it. That's awesome. So that's been a big game changer. And I'm fine now. That's even more awesome. (laughs) Thank you. I love that. (laughs) Uh, Amy, I have so 
thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Me too. Me too. Some some really cool stuff. Uh, As you know, I wrap up every episode of my show by asking my guests, what is their biggest helping? The single most important piece of information you'd like somebody to walk away with after hearing our conversation today? I think biggest helping that I, that is the rule in my house. And I share with people because it's a small thing. We can all do it. Look up from your screens for 15 minutes a day. If my 16 year old can do it, I promise you can do it. And when people say, well, what do you want me to do in those 15 minutes? I say, do anything. Go talk to a colleague, go talk to your husband, go talk to your wife, have a glass of wine, read a book, make dinner, take a walk or read something. But I believe, and it's not a punishment. We're all attached to these. We all have these. But I believe that when we look up from our screens for 15 minutes a day, we think differently, we communicate differently, and we prioritize our lives differently. And when you go back to your screens, you'll see things more perceptively. So I hope we can all take 15 minutes a day and look up and look around because I believe the greatest sources of innovation are right in front of our eyes. Beautifully said. I love that. Amy, where, where can people find you? They can find me in a couple of places. Um, my recent TED Talk is at uh, ted.com slash Amy Herman. That's easy. Uh, Artful Perception is my website where they can find out information about my program. And visualintelligencebook.com gives you all the information about my book. Perfect. And we'll have links to everything Amy Herman, including that TED Talk. Thank you. And in the show notes at thedailyhelping.com as well as in the Daily Helping app. Uh, Amy, this was so great. Thanks again for coming on the show. I loved having you. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And thanks to each and every one of you who chose to tune into this episode. If you like what you heard, go subscribe to us on iTunes because this is what helps other people find the show. Most importantly, though, go out there today and do something nice for someone else, even if you don't know who they are, and post it in your social media feeds using the hashtag MyDailyHelping, because the happiest people are those that help others. <laughs>